welcome to Data Skeptic All About Surveys, our season about survey design, interpretation, and methodology. Let your voice be heard at survey.dataskeptic.com. I'm going to keep this short because I'm under the weather, as you can hear. I feel fine. I just sound terrible. It's a weird cold. It's not COVID. Anyway, today on the show, I speak with former guest and longtime friend Susan Gerbic. She took a bunch of the surveys that are available at survey.dataskeptic.com and had some very constructive feedback. We go through that, write our own survey that was already launched, and then after the break, we come back, review the results, and talk a little bit about some videos Susan's been working on. I am Susan Gerbic. I am the leader and founder of the Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Project. I am the founder of Monterey County Skeptics. I am the founder and leader of the Gorilla Skeptics. I am a fellow of the Center for Inquiry. I am a fellow for GWUP, which is the German Skeptics. I guess that's it. It's a good list. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> well, I know you've participated in some of the surveys I've launched and had some feedback for me. And also, uh, before we get into that, I know you'd mentioned taking a course in survey design, which I was hoping I could ask you a few things about. Okay, so it's been a few years, but I'll be happy to make something up for you. <laughs> right. Pretend I remember it. <laughs> well, what brought you to a course? How did this fit into your academic interests? Well, I do have a degree in social and behavioral sciences, and I started it when I was 39. So I was a, an older student. Our college nearby where I live is California State University of Monterey Bay. So the university that opened up near me is called CSUMB. And it opened up as, you know, when I was an adult. So I wasn't able to really go to school, have, you know, a college degree younger. Before that, I had taken some classes at our community college. And one of them was this statistics class which was where we had to use a handheld device, you know, a TR, what is that, Texas instrument? TR. I had a TR 81, something like that myself. It was, it was yeah. insane. It was insane. It, the instructions to put anything into the computer were probably, you know, multiple paragraphs long. It was so, so silly. And then when I got over to CSUMB, I had two classes. One was on uh, design and one was on like understanding statistics and you know why how to evaluate the data that you're finding out so it was really interesting once i got into you know a higher level college class i think i think statistics are are fun absolutely sometimes frustrating but always insightful <laughs> well you can almost make them say what you want them to say well yeah that can be some of the frustration you're right mm -hmm. um, which is easy to do with a bad survey design oh oh yeah Oh, I've always, those always frustrate me. So have I frustrated you with some of my recent surveys? <laughs> yeah, actually, Kyle, you have, because I was looking at your, I was taking some of your, your um, surveys. Uh -huh. You had said some of them were fun and I thought, okay, these are great. I'll take them. And I'm, I'm looking at them going, wait a minute. I have no idea how to answer this. I don't know how to back out of it. I don't know how mm. to skip it. And I thought, well, this doesn't apply to me. So he's going to get really bad data. And it bothers me whenever people get bad data because people make assumptions based on that data. And I was just like, come on, Kyle, you're supposed to know this. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely some holes in uh, our current setup. Any in particular that stood out as being particularly frustrating or hard to answer? Let's just take the general study, the yeah. general survey, the, the first one people get when they come in. Okay, now I know this is all kind of fun in a lot of ways, but, you know, what is your professional title? What the heck? I'm retired. Well, retired then. But I don't really want to put retired because I'm not retired. I'm very, very busy. And mm. so I think I put cat herder or something like that when I uh -huh. filled it out, which means that it was an invalid choice. It's like, it's like writing in a candidate on a political, uh, you know, when you're voting, it's just silly, but I don't know how to skip it or I don't know how to go around it. How long have I listened to the data skeptic? Well, gosh, I can't remember when you started. So it seems like it's been four years, but maybe it hasn't been four years, but it's been as long as you've been going, I think. Well, I don't remember as a choice. Maybe I should have added. That's a good point. Or put a year. Yeah. You started, or I don't know, but that just, felt, uh, just seemed a little odd. What? Then you said, okay, now how often do you use an ad blocker, which is one of the shows you did was on ad blockers. And mm -hmm. that was quite interesting. I, th I thought that was really interesting. I thought most people 
use to add blockers except for myself, but I don't know. How often do you use it? Usually you turn it on or you turn it off. You don't usually have a in between. Do you, do people turn off their ad blockers part of the time? Well, I wasn't sure. Well, I'll take the point on this one. I think uh, I was trying to be inclusive, giving them always, sometimes, and never hoping that people, everyone fits into one of those bins. Uh, even if sometimes is unpopular, because I agree, why would you turn it off and on too much? Maybe because some sites, you know, tell you they won't show you their content without it or whatever, but uh, an attempt to be inclusive. Well, maybe if it had said, are you currently using an ad blocker or in the last year or maybe giving yourself a very narrow time frame? So is the, your computer device currently using an ad blocker? And then do we use ad blockers on our phones? Because I don't think I do. Do they? I don't even use it on my main computer. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't think it's as popular on mobile phones, although I'm sure there's something out there if you know you want to install it. So going to the next one, how many books did you read last year? That really frustrated me. That question right there just, just stopped me in my traps. Because I wanted an integer. I didn't give you ranges. Well, and again, you know, what is read? Is it listen to <laughs> yeah, this is a great debate I know this drove me nuts because I really like to be factual I like numbers but you only can get anywhere with your stats if you have good data true so I thought it was just too broad so I'm thinking well I've listened to a ton of books oh my gosh I listen to a lot of audiobooks but this is read good point I should clarify and maybe say read or listened to well it just depends on the purpose of your of your question because are you trying to find out if we're people who listen to audiobooks for whatever reason is it because you really want to know how many books we have turned pages on do we comprehend them what kind of books are we talk about children's uh -huh. books young adult textbooks what, what, what sure <laughs> next question how many years have you been at your current residence i don't know i guess i could give you a year but it just felt odd I don't what, know why what would have been better why do you want to know that um a curi general curiosity all right. I guess that one's okay. But then if we get into Actually, the Actually, uh -huh. my colleague David found a good problem with it. He said he has been at his residence under a year. So he wanted to put 0.5, but I was only accepting whole numbers. So he was like, what, what do I put <laughs> zero or one? Neither are correct. Oh, that's true. And then, I don't know, maybe if there was a range, maybe under a year, uh, a year to five years, or I don't know, maybe some kind of range, because I really didn't know. And I had to sit and do some math and, you know, who wants to do math when you're doing a survey? Because it said, how many years? So I said, okay, let me think. What year did I move in here? Okay. How many years is that? Let me let me, let me me subtract here. I, I don't know. That's a fair point. Yeah. You should be pushing back on me, Kyle, because I'm being cruel. I'm no, being, I want to find ways tough. to improve this. <laughs> Where do I get to the other surveys? Do I have to finish this one before I can get to the next one? So if you're looking at a results page, the bottom will say, uh, let your opinion be heard. Click here to take another. Or if you're currently filling it out, you complete it. And then it'll ask you if you want to see the results or take others. But the problem is I've already completed this. Right. So I don't want to take it again because then I'm going to mess up with your numbers because I'll be t t taking the same study twice. So how well, do that I part we've got sorted. Um, so it's oh. going to it puts a cookie on your computer until you clear your cookies. So it remembers you, and it remembers you took the onboarding survey. So when you come back, it'll skip that. I got at well, least I'm, that part working good. Well, I'm back, and it hasn't skipped it. So how do I skip it? Oh, I guess your cookies got cleared. No, I haven't cleared any cookies. I uh, ate some cookies the other day, but I haven't cleared my I don't know if that would do it. Hmm. Maybe and, your, your browser clears them for you as a security feature or something. No, I, I don't have anything sophisticated. Yeah. It went to look at my results. So let's look at the results. Oh, how fun. Oh, my gosh. Almost everybody who listens is male. Yeah. I don't know what to do about that. Wow. What do you think? Wow. Wow. Overwhelmingly male in listenership. 178 to 43. That is incredible. What is it about data that is a male thing? Or is it just... What? what? So I wish I had the answer. I truly don't. I will note, though, that it is a reflection of the field and of STEM more in general, not to give myself a pass to saying why I'm imbalanced. But uh, like in the past when I've hired, I see about that ratio of resumes incoming. It'll be 10 to 1 male to female. I thought we were doing a better job with getting more women into STEM. 
are they not going in, into statistics or anything like that? What, what I, does that mean? I don't have good numbers on this. I think there has been a good amount of effort to improve this and that effort has been fruitful. The, the numbers are evolving, but I, I don't think we're anywhere near parity, which is what I think you should expect. There's mm-hmm. no reason it shouldn't be equal. Well, you do have quite a few guests on that are female. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that would change anything. I don't know why it would, but I, I, a lot of your guests are in the field and they're female. I don't know if you are intentionally trying to find female, you know, interviewees. Well, I'm not explicit about it. Like uh, we have to, you know, meet a quota or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Although I will say like from time to time we have a run of only men and it seems a little weird and we will think more about that. Um, But yeah, it's, it's not, I mean, our priority is the research always uh, more than anything, but that shouldn't be the only priority. That's that's interesting. Well, you know, you know, Kyle, because I've been in this world for a very, very long time with the, well, I guess it's not very, very long, but a long time for um, the skeptical field. And there are there are genders with our with our pseudoscience, and I find that fascinating. You know, men tend to be UFOs, uh, chemtrails, Bigfoot. Uh-huh. And a lot of conspiracies where women tend to be more interested in it, in the psychic world. Um, you know, it's just, it's just an interesting kind of division. If you're, if you, the interest, and I don't really understand it either, but maybe men tend to like airplanes and cars and things like that. I don't know. That sounds really, really, uh, I don't know why. If it's a natural thing, it's okay. Like yours is a really great example. The fact that men are interested in Bigfoot and women are interested in psychics. Well, it's pick your flavor of weird stuff that you want to be interested (laughs) in. It's fine. But they gravitate to that area. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. But if you were to go to a UFO conference, I I expect almost everybody there is male. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty confident those are the stats. (laughs) Thanks to our sponsor, Neptune.ai. 99% of machine learning teams are doing awesome things at a reasonable scale with four people and two production models. But most of the industry best practices come from a handful of companies operating models at hyperscale. The folks over at Neptune.ai want to change that by sharing insights, tool stacks, and real-life stories from practitioners doing machine learning and ML ops at a reasonable scale. They even built a flexible tool for experiment tracking and model registry that will fit with your workflow at no scale, reasonable scale, and beyond. Check them out at Neptune.ai. Like so many of you out there, I love Notion, our sponsor today, and I use it every day for notes, docs, and project management. It's a great tool, and I'm going to assume most of you have already tried it, because today I want to tell you about the new buzz around AI. Specifically, what Notion has just launched in their new incredible tool, Notion AI. Notion AI helps you work faster, write better, and think bigger, doing tasks that normally take you hours and just seconds. Everyone's aware of the recent advances in large language models, and Notion has one of the most impressive rollouts of it. They have some really cool other tools, like helping you rewrite a paragraph to sound more professional or more casual or one of the labels you choose. Just tell Notion AI what to do. The more details, the better. Have it write a blog post, make an outline, brainstorm ideas, or summarize a whole bunch of documents. Notion AI is an impressive choice for writing, summarizing pages, finding action items, inline translation, and whatever you need to have the IDE for running your life. You can select any text in Notion and click Ask AI. For a limited time only, try Notion AI for free when you go to Notion.com slash Data Skeptic. That's all lowercase letters. Notion.com slash Data Skeptic to try out the incredible power of Notion AI today. And when you use our link, you're supporting the show. This is a limited time offer. Try Notion AI for free right now at notion.com slash data skeptic. Okay, so highest le- level of a, uh, education you've achieved. Man, master's degree. Look at that. You have an educated a podcast. But Indeed. Listeners, but th- I guess that kind of makes sense. You know, who would want to listen to statistical talk yep. <laughs> without it? Okay. How many people read books? Oh, 14. Oh, we're on an average of 15. That's 
That's a lot. Yeah, it is. It may be influenced by some heavy hitters in there. Like the maximum someone put is 250 books they read, which is pretty incredible. <laughs> so I need oh. to break this out. I'm going to make it more of a distribution so you can see where the clusters of numbers are. Because the mean oh. doesn't tell the whole story anymore. That doesn't make sense unless they're reading. I mean, come on. All right. How can you be a listener to the channel, uh, to your podcast, 365 days a year, and they're reading how many? 250. Not quite a book a day. Well, here's a problem I thought of. Perhaps mm. that's a parent counting the books they read their children. I didn't really oh. ask. Ooh, bedtime stories. That would do it. If you read a bedtime story almost every night to your child, that's that's a book. Sure. Oh, there's a problem with your data. Uh huh. <laughs> your question, I should say. Yeah, that. exactly. Oh, my goodness. But How I don't want my question to become some contract of like, with respect to what you answered in part A, but not counting uh, <laughs> these books. Uh, how many years have you been at your current residence? Six, almost seven. Yeah. Run it. That's, that seems probably typical of, of society. Listening preference, headphones. Hi, people listening to us on the headphones right now. Most of you, yeah. Primary means, okay, you own your own car. Okay, so... Click here to take another. All right. So, so far, so good. All right. Now, board games. I love board games. I really do. So, how many board games do I own? I have no idea how <laughs> I get it. should have a range. Board games. Board games mean a board on the ground. So, it wouldn't be like dominoes or Jenga or – but it would be chess or checkers, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with you on all these technicalities. Definitely. Okay. All right. How many hours per month do you spend playing – board games i don't know how many hours a month who if you have to think gosh surveys is scary well so what i wanted here was something about frequency maybe i should reword it if you want if you have a suggestion because i'm anymore an infrequent player i do like board games but i just don't have time for them i don't have like a regular every wednesday we meet and play them but i know i have those listeners so i want to get some relative distribution about the frequency with which you play them well, how many would be a lot of board games? How many hours per month? Well, or how many how many board games would I own? I mean, I have cupboards with them in it. I think it's a hundred. Wow, I've got a bunch of board. I've got all the board games my kids had growing up. So even though we don't play them anymore, you know, They're Clue there. and Shoots and Ladders and Ouija boards and I don't know. I mean, I can imagine we have a hundred easily. And how many hours? Do you spend playing? Well, when you do sit down and play, you usually play about four hours, right? So I guess not that much because I don't have a regular game night, like you, like you said. So probably maybe five. Kickstarter. No, I don't think I have, but my son's done a lot of those. That's probably why some of the games are still sitting around the house. <laughs> and how often do you visit BoardGameGeek.com? I've never visited it. That's an odd question. Are you a fan of games by the independent game designer Charles Elliott? I have no idea. I've never heard of Charles Elliott. That's good because I made him up. This was a trick question. I oh, to I wrote, not sure. Okay. How many good of these answer. games are you playing? Oh, Monopoly, of course. Life, of course. Candyland, but you know, that's been a long time ago. And Cults Across America, I think you made that up. And so is... That is a real game. No. Yeah, I have a copy somewhere. <laughs> okay, Settlers of Catan. I've never played it, but I've heard all about it. Car... Carcassoni. Carcassonne, I think is how it's pronounced. Pandemic, I've heard of that. Mm -hmm. I heard it came out years before our It did indeed. <laughs> when, when I assume passed. they saw a boost. I don't really know how that works. <laughs> Somebody's getting, okay, so now I'm done. So let me see the results. I like that you have the results instantly because I love to look at the results. Well, there's one challenge there is I don't show the results until 10 people have taken it because I didn't oh. want anybody to yeah. de-anonymize somehow. So it kind of stinks if you're the first nine people, though. Well, you could say, I guess, I don't know, maybe it could come up. We'll show it to you when 10 people have taken this. It we'll tells you. Yeah, it'll say you need three more friends. people. Oh, I should have a share button. That would get it there faster. Share to your friends so that we can show you results because we haven't had enough people do it. Right. Okay, how many hours you play a month? Four. That's about what I said. And then boardgamegeek.com. Um, 36 have never visited. That's the main question. So it doesn't look like they get a really good turnout there. Are you a fan of the independent game designer? Well, most of us said no or not sure. So good. nobody's heard of them. Nobody said, oh, yeah, 
I know him. Which of these games have you played? Life, of course. Number one is Monopoly. Mm-hmm. You know, Monopoly is a sad game because nobody makes friends. It's always ends in it ends in destruction and hate and <laughs> not hate, but just frustration and anger. Yeah. I don't know what it is about it. My kids won't play on. Monopoly with me. Same with Risk. I'm I, I tend to be very competitive and I'm very strategic, and I play a mean game of Risk. Should I try another one of these? Sure. Which one should I do? This one, retirement. I backed out. I started to take it, and then I backed out. Oh, good. Tell me why. Because then I didn't capture you, so this is a loss for me. Because I'm already retired. Let me see what doesn't apply. Your retirement plan. Well, at what age do you plan to retire? Yeah, it should be, Did do you plan or did you? Yeah, I need some branching here, because it is a major factor if you have already or not. Yeah, I've already retired, sort of. I mean, I'm retired. I, I am no longer working in employment that I was working in for 34 years. And so I'm not taking a retirement. I don't have a retirement income. You're right. It's slanted. I was forced into retirement. I did not have savings. I was given savings to retire. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then, so at what age did I start with saving for retirement? Zero. At what age do you plan on retiring? Well, I was 54. I didn't plan on retiring. I was told to retire because my company rebuilt and didn't rebuild a place for me to work. So would you retire earlier if you had more savings? It's only a yes or no. What does that mean? I did retire right. early. On a scale of one to 10, how worried are you about retired retirement? I guess I'm already here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this, this is a good one to just... back out of. You're absolutely right. Okay. What is your largest concern with regard to retirement? Okay. Yeah. Not having enough money, legacy, living comfortably, traveling. I'm not concerned. Yeah. So I had to back out of this one. So that one was kind of like a waste. I said, oh, I can't take this. What was my favorite completed season? I have no idea. You've had some that are just standalone um, ones that I've enjoyed more than others, I think. And so I don't remember which one they fell under, but I think think it was fake news. I'm looking at the results now. So we've got one to three years. People have been listening to Data Skeptic. I think that should be seems like it should be because one to three seems like a lot of years different. I don't know why. So maybe like a one year uh, under one year. Well, I don't know your favorite season. Wow. What was it? The ad tech ad tech was the most popular so far. However, Is keep in mind recent? that's the most recent one. Uh, uh, <laughs> for whatever. Some people remember it. Time series. Was that before ad tech? Two ago. Uh, it's one of the more recent ones. What was the one right before ad tech? Uh, I believe K means clustering. Or no, no, no. We did uh, physically distributed, all about working remote. Actually, I don't know anymore. Sorry, it's all blurring. And nobody wanted to. And, and that's the one that. I'm not surprised. Like, I talked to some really interesting people, but just thematically, that wasn't the strongest theme. Still, it seems to be the ones that were most recent were the ones that their favorites, which is kind of not fair because these are people who have only been, you've got under Although, six months, six to 12 mm-hmm. months, you've got nine, 14 together. So it could be they're exploring the archives though. We have all the old episodes are still up. Well, that's true. Maybe they went back and listened. Well, I guess my fake news isn't going to win. It's half of whatever the ad tech is. When a new episode drops, yeah, I think that most people do, oh, well, look, 24 of them go based on the title. You know what I'd like to see? Here's another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there is there a survey on here on podcasting? Or I can't remember. Let's write one right now. I think you had one, didn't you? I have uh, some basic stuff about podcast listening habits, but it's pretty surface level. We can draft a survey right now if you think. Okay, let's do that. All right. Would that be helpful to your listeners? Absolutely. Okay, let's do it. Hold on, I'm gonna open up the application. I'll share my screen. I get to see. I get to see how the sausage sausage is made, people. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you have more tabs open than I do. It's all <laughs> one screen. Go in here. Yeah, I'm a big tab person. You only use one screen? No, I have two, but I shared one so that you'd be able to see it. All right, what's our survey about? Listening habits of podcasts. Podcast listening habits. What do we ask? So is this like the first question? Yep, our first question. So I have several questions I would like answered. Let's do I, it. I would really be interested in the results of these, okay? Yeah. How many hours do you listen to a podcast on an average week? You know, 
what you would consider podcasting. Should we break down podcasting to mean, does podcasting have a, have an actual definition? Is it only? I mean, technically it's something with an RSS feed, but broadly I would say it's something that is audio or it can be video, but mostly audio and just comes out with some regular frequency. So it can't be a book on tape or anything like that. No, definitely not a book on tape. Yeah. Okay. And it can't be listening to a TV show or like a YouTube video of the news. That wouldn't be a podcast. No, but I mean, if, if your interest is how do people consume media, we could ask like about these things, which are the, how much of your media comes from each of these places? Where do you get your news? No, I think let's stick with what we have because I think we're going to get too confusing. Right. Anyway, okay. So should it be a number or do we want to give them ranges? I think let's give them ranges. All right. How many, say it again. How many hours do you listen a week? To podcasts per week. To podcasts a week, yeah. And then we should give them a, a zero as an option. Yeah, except they're listening to you on a podcast. Right. It would be very <laughs> puzzling if someone picked that, but it's also kind of a red herring test. If you put zero to a number, does that mean we don't include zero? So it would be, it's always bothered me. Yeah. So this is similar to that issue earlier. I'm less bothered by this, so like, because you could say I listen to half an episode a week, but that's weird. So I would be comfortable with one, or do you want to say like one to three? And it says hours. So a podcast could only be like Skeptroids, only 20 minutes long. True. Should we make it time or episodes? Well, it's hours. But I mean, you could listen to four or five Skeptoid episodes in an hour. Easy. True. So how many hours do you listen to podcasts per week? How many episodes do you listen to a week? I think we should probably stay with and go with time because mm -hmm. if you listen to zero or if you listen to a 20 minute, let's say you only listen to a 20 minute episode a week. Oh, that does get tricky. Them. Yeah. They because be in there. I listen to one news thing that's about 10 minutes long and it comes out daily. And what if that was my only thing, right? Then I would. Well, that's daily. Yeah. Even though so, I listen to 50 minutes a week. So how would you, how would you frame this in your thing? So can you put under one or is that not a. Yeah, we could put under one. How many hours per week do you spend listening to podcasts under one hour? Oh yeah. We get to use that little carrot thing. Yeah, how about let's do zero. Cause that's a distinct thing, right? Zero okay. hours. Not at all. Then under one hour, one hour to three and then three, obviously to Three to six, and then maybe six six plus one, two. Well, now here's a challenge. What if they listen to exactly three hours? We just put one to three and three to six. What would you suggest? I'm actually okay with that. I think people get that, like, you know, I don't think anyone would say, I listen to precisely three hours of podcasts, and then I stop anyways. I think you would just <laughs> pick where you feel is appropriate. So that's a survey design sin I will commit, I think. <laughs> People are going to be listening to this and they're going to know. Three they're all going to try hours. to hit three. <laughs> and then we okay, put seven plus. plus hours, which, you know. Oh, yeah. All right. It might be 15. It might be 30. It might be, don't you think? Well, maybe we ask a follow-up. Given the range above, can you estimate your exact number of hours? I like that question because that sure would be interesting if it was like 10 if you got an overwhelming amount that were 10 or more you know i've been told now i don't know if this is true that a lot of places a lot of countries really listen to podcasts and a lot of countries it hasn't picked up yet it hasn't it hasn't become a thing yet yeah that's true we get almost no north korean listeners <laughs> and we have uh, an above average number of australian listeners given the population no North Koreans. I mean, the language barrier is there, but then there is the Great Firewall as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Another thing I'd really like to know is how many I think they should have to look at their phone or whatever their podcast uh -huh. app is and count how many are on. How many do they subscribe to? I'd like to know that. So that could be just an integer because they go to your phone, count how many are on there. How many do you subscribe to? And that'd be really interested in how many do you regularly listen to? Because I have a feeling that lots of people subscribe to stuff and just skip them each time. I think we've got to work on the question though, because remember there could be some person that never listens to podcasts. Maybe they only know Data Skeptic because they found it on YouTube and they listen to the audio there. Hmm. Let's make it a multi-select and say okay. how many podcasts 
do you subscribe to? And then we can say none as one option. But now we can give some ranges too. So we're not going to tell them, go to your phone. I guess we're going to have oh. to assume they're going to go to their phone. Let's ask them to do that. Well, do people only listen to podcasts on their phone? No, huh? I think if you're a subscriber, like there are definitely desktop applications that will do that service, but I think those are not so popular. Most people, most podcast listeners, I presume, or maybe we're going to find out in this question, they have an app like Apple Podcasts or Podcast Republic or one of those, or Castro, and that's how they consume the media. Okay. How would we, how would we ask that question so that it includes a phone or a, a, a service that they use on their desktop? All right, I think we need a couple questions. How do you consume podcasts? Or let's say, how do you primarily, because they could do it in a couple ways, consume podcasts? And then we'll put what we assume is the most popular answer, an app on my phone. And then we can say an app on my desktop computer, a web app. Okay. Maybe we could say overhearing them on a... Oh, that's really good. I didn't even think about it. They may listen to it at a workplace. Somebody may play it for multiple people. What do you think of this option? Hearing them at a work slash social slash family setting. Because you could be driving around with your spouse and they put one on. Oh, that's brilliant. I hadn't even thought of it. But do you know what? I think that's a lot more common than you think. A lot of people are turned on by podcasts because there's they were in a car with somebody who had turned it on. You got to listen to this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to listen to this. We should have I don't listen. I don't consume podcasts, even though it's paradoxical for the audience. We should be complete. Okay. Then should, what was the other question we were going to ask before that? Oh, how many do you subscribe to? Yeah, I'm really curious about that. Should we make it a range or a number? I think it should be a number because they should be looking at whatever device it is that yeah. they listen to it and count them. Please check your app and count and tell us the number of Right, not just a Podcast guess. I, I'm really to. interested in this. Ooh, this yeah. is getting exciting. Zero for none. <laughs> I want to see the results of these. Now that we've asked that question, I'm really interested in, of the ones subscribed, how many do you actually listen to? Mm -hmm. Or how many on average do you actually listen? How many on average do you listen to per week? How about how many do you faithfully listen to every time? Faithfully. Ooh, you're using one of those peacock words or one of those words that's really like, okay, faithful. Okay. Well, because some podcasts are monthly, so I don't want someone to say like, well, I listen to all of them, but it's bi-weekly show, so I can't put weekly. Okay, I like that. That's good. That's good. And then it faithfully leaves some interpretation open mm -hmm. so that like, you know, maybe you let them stack up for a while and then you listen to all of them. Okay. All right. So that's a number two. What else would be really interesting to know? Maybe about what topics they're going for. Should we think that out for them ahead of time so that it falls into distinct categories or should we leave it open for them to answer? Well, if we pick our categories, then it's easier for the results to be shared. If we have it as a type in, I don't know a good way to aggregate it. Like the occupation kind of in a way. Where yeah, similar problem. You get a better answer if you ask the full text, but it's also people can put just about anything. Okay, so should we should we cheat and look at something that another how how they you know categorize podcasts? Well, we could, but I find a lot of the common ways to be sensationally boring. Okay, they'll put like science and technology, and then you know health and wellness, and it's so broad to me. I don't know. Okay, I agree. What uh, what types of podcasts do you gravitate towards? So are we asking them to pick one type? I think it should be checkboxes. They pick as many as they want. Okay. Science and skeptical content, of course. Mm -hmm. We might as well put paranormal content. Mm -hmm. uh, religion? Yep. Or Religious. faith or whatever. News. Faith and religion. Finance, probably. Finance, oh yeah. News. Uh-huh. True crime. Oh, good one. Comedy. Yep. Oh, and also entertainment. You know, they listen to what's going on with J-Lo and all those people. I don't Should know. we put entertainment slash celebrity? Yeah, okay. Oh, we got to put something about technology. Of course. Separate from science. Tech and... Culture and society. I don't know how you would even... That's broad. Uh, not fat. Culture. I don't know. Culture would fit... I listen to a lot of ska podcasts. Should we put music? As a podcast? Oh, is the topic? Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. That makes sense. I don't listen to him, but I guess George Robb might fit under that. In a way, yeah. I mean, he's 
he's music, but he's also so much more. So I guess. Yeah, you're listening for him in a way. Yeah, you would have to just kind of fit this so that it they're going to have to do their best. Well, that's a challenge. Everyone has a different. I mean, we can kind of all agree on what's true crime or not, but certain shows, it's hard to put them in the right bin. So are you a tech programming electronics or are you a science and skeptical content? I'd like to think I'm in both, but uh, it would be interesting to see where people categorize me. Wow, that's true. I'm thinking about it now. I would probably put tech just without thinking about it too much. But then if I started thinking about it a little bit more, I would put you under science and skeptical content. I mean, we, you and I did a thing on Bigfoot Uh huh. way back in the time. This isn't, you know, my second time here, I think. Third? Third. Third. That's right. Third appearance. If I had an option where they could write in other, I would put it. We're building that out. It'll be here soon. Okay. I'm curious about how many, okay, so how many they actually listen to. I don't know how you would word this, but I would be interested in if people cure their curl, cur, what is the word? If they go through and eliminate unsubscribe to stuff, I would be interested if, I know I feel guilty if I subscribe to a channel and then I see that I'm not listening to it. I feel really guilty about seeing it on my on my you know phone keep coming up over, over time. So maybe uh-huh. twice a year I go in and I... I just eliminate them, unsubscribe. Ooh, it's scary because I feel like I'm, you know, I really had good intentions. It's like wanting to be on a diet or something. I had good intentions. I wanted to listen to this thing and I haven't listened to these. I don't know if that would be a question that could be answered because I bet almost nobody does that. How often do you unsubscribe? Well, how about if we ask about some paying of your regularly listened programs or something like How many do you actually, have you written a review of them? So if it's something you really like, do you write a review and do you financially support them? Because I think everybody's got a Patreon or something. How many do you financially support? Right. And then the same exact question, how many have you written a review of? Gosh, I hope that I'm not embarrassing myself with all these questions that aren't. Because when we used to design a survey, we would spend a lot of time going over the questions and going over the questions and making sure we worded them correctly. I think you have to, really. It was it was not like you and I are doing this pretty quick. It was never done like this. And then we'd also look at old studies of other places had done, you know, to try to really get the nuance of the question. Oh, that's smart. It's short and sweet. I know people will finish it. <laughs> Oh, come on. Let's think of one more question. Let's see. All right. If you're out doing a task, well, I don't have it on a, how do I say? I listen to it based on how long, whatever task I'm going to do. So if I'm, if I'm working in the garden and I'm listening to podcasts, which is where I do a lot of my listening. Oh, that's a good question. But if, if I'm doing that, I might say, well, I don't want to listen to, I'll listen to Squaring the Strange because that's about an hour. And I'll say, that's a good one because I can do an hour's worth of content out here. And then that's about how long I was going to stay in the garden. I want a good long format one. I don't want to listen to something that's like a 10, 15 minute one when I'm out in the garden working. Yeah. Cause I don't want to be messing with my phone. I want a good point. So I'll put it on for an hour. And that is something I really would like an answer to. And I know I've heard this on the skeptic zone too. He'll say, you know, what are you doing while you're listening to the podcast? So, That's a question I'd like to have. I'd really like to know, what are people doing when they're listening? Where do you generally listen to your podcast? What are you doing? What activity are you doing? Well, let's close it out with that. Let's ask an open-ended, what are you doing when you listen to podcasts? Yeah. Well, how about this? What if I push it live? We'll get some responses and then I can live reveal them to you. I would love that. All right. Okay. So this is the one at the bottom that is the... um, What are you doing when you listen to the... That's right. Yeah. In the results page I shared, I don't share the full text anybody types. It just felt like a privacy thing, you know? I mean, we just ask them, what are you doing when you listen to a podcast? That's not exactly a a, a confidential answer, but there could be other cases where I ask something open-ended and I just didn't want to open that up to anybody to see. So I sent you the Google sheet that lists all of the open-ended and I sorted them alphabetically which doesn't necessarily sound like a smart thing to do, except for the fact that a lot of people said one word answers and it helps to group it. Yeah. I'm looking at it. How many say driving 22 somewhere in there, mm-hmm. right? So 25% roughly. Cause we had about a hundred people. 88 filled out the free text and working. I don't know, I guess means at work. 
<laughs> well, yeah, there's <laughs> not there's, like gardening or something or cleaning the house. Well, there's someone who specifically said working in the yard, so I would count that as outdoors. And then there's working out, which is an entirely different thing. But oh, yeah, so work is actually a pretty bad indication of what they're. Well, I think that means you're being paid to do some activity. You're earning your wage, and uh, presumably you're allowed to listen to podcasts at the same time. So in other words, you're not staring at a screen, you are moving around, or you're, you know, you're not like engaging like in a game or something. For working out, yeah. Exercise. Exercise, yeah. Exercise household, jogging, knitting or crocheting, lying in bed, nothing. <laughs> I like how they spell it. Nothing. Showering. They listen when they shower. Exclusively showering, too. That's the only thing they listed. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. That's a, a <laughs> tiny window of time in one's day to only consume podcasts. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they go, oh, we should save this for the show. Okay, oh, I'm so recording. We got all this for the show. Oh, we're recording now? <laughs> okay. You guys, this is creepy. Yeah, this is a little creepy because we got this list of how what people are doing when they're listening to podcasts. And one person put that they're showering. Hopefully they <laughs> took the survey at the computer. <laughs> Knitting or crocheting, they probably do a lot. It's probably a great time for podcasts, yeah. Well, yeah, actually, I think I've listened to quite a few books on tape when I'm, I'm trying to get through a project, you know, that's like a cross stitch or you're trying to do hem something or you're sewing something up or, you know, I don't want to be looking at a screen. Six people said they listen while exercising, while five people said they listen while working out, which I think we can agree is the same thing, but have to group those in some way. I guess driving was about what I expected. More cooking than I thought. That's not where I think of like, oh, I'm going to listen to podcasts while I cook. But a few of those. Three three are related to dogs. Yeah, a lot of walking dogs. One of the questions in particular that I we Topic got some good topics. feedback on was the topics of interest, right? Yeah, we got we got some we got some bad we got some criticism. Yeah, there. sure a little but, bit. You know, I'm not an expert on this. I was just doing what I thought and. Off the top of my head, this is the best we could do. We got a lot of science and skeptical content, which is obvious because we are talking to a, a group of people who are science and skeptical minded. Yep. Selection bias there. Right. But we missed law. Yes. No law podcasts, which are big. Um, I know I just subscribed to a podcast that was dealing with photos and how you organize them. I guess that would be under... Not Doesn't right. fit our category as well, no. If we had had crafting, which is quite broad, maybe there. Oh, I know what we were missing, and this is really telling. There's no sports. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course there's no sports podcast. <laughs> uh, that's a big miss, I guess. So we really didn't do well on that. But I think we did well on some of the others. I, I see some really glaring, interesting topics that I'm really surprised about. The things I wanted to see... Mm-hmm. That I really wanted the survey to answer is how vested are you in your podcast that you're listening to? Do you feel, I was trying to figure out how to ask the question, do you feel a relationship of some sort with your podcast or the host or hosts of the podcast? How do you, how would I evaluate it? Do you feel like you're supporting them? And the way I thought the best way of doing that was, do you leave a review and do you support them financially? And that was really eye-opening. I, I get the feeling that people think of their podcasts as just, I don't know, that you're making money somewhere else, or this is a just a hobby, or it's just, it doesn't matter if it goes out to other, other people and grows. I just thought that was really interesting how few people support their podcasts. Really surprised, actually, especially from our community. Well, let's expand upon that. So we're looking at the two results pages, and people can look at the show notes if they want to see what we're seeing. But for those that, since at least a quarter of you are driving, I don't want you to pull up a web page. <laughs> don't look, the, guys. Uh, don't look. Or walking the dog. That might be right? that might be bad. You might step on a crack and break your mother's back or something. The modal answer in both of these, that is the most popular answer, is zero. Uh, most people have left zero reviews by a lot. And uh, also by a lot, most people support zero podcasts financially. Very shocking. Because I, I, well, I could have told you about the financial support stuff. It's <laughs> less than one percent, kind of a thing at best. But I mean, that's that's sort of natural. You kind of expect that. 
Well, I would have thought it'd be higher, especially with a small podcast that doesn't have, you know, 100,000 subscribers or whatever. I know for something like if I was watching or listening to This American Life, something that's huge or, you know, one of the big, big name ones, I don't really feel a need to support them financially because I know they're making they're making bank. But smaller, you know, maybe who have a thousand subscribers or even under 10,000 uh, downloads a week, I would think that we should be supporting them if you enjoy it. I mean, because right. what's the incentive for the person who's making the podcast if they don't feel that, feel a little love back? Because why, why continue this? There's a lot of work that goes into putting on a podcast, especially a weekly podcast. And it just probably feels like it's a one-way street. I don't know. Kyle, what do you think? How does it feel? Well, I've been doing it for a while. Uh, I don't necessarily feel that way because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm not just a producer. I'm a big consumer. Mm -hmm. And I don't support everyone. There's even a few that I adore and listen to the moment they come out that I just haven't supported. Actually, for me, that's because I support maybe eight or nine at this point. And it just feels like, all right, we got to keep the, the pocketbook in check a little bit. Uh, but maybe I should reallocate. But I don't push hard. I haven't done a big telethon or anything because I get what are called halo benefits from doing the show in terms of reputation and prestige. And we've picked up a couple of clients on the consulting side and that's worth, you know, a, a, a multiple orders of magnitude more than one subscriber. So for me to come on every week and beg a little bit, I just haven't had time for it. But uh, if someone wants to support the show, do it or support some other show that you love. Uh, creators always need the uh, a little bit of gumption. I wonder if it's not, it's tied to that. They need to be reminded for one thing. True. I don't yeah. think we, like you said, um, I know I ran a nonprofit and I am the worst at, at um, raising funds. Absolutely. The worst people will say, you know, I'd like to donate some money for you to your nonprofit. And I kind of feel like, well, it's okay. I'm not really doing anything this moment. You know, I feel bad not out saying, Oh yeah, I'll take your money. But I, I'm not good at that. And I think a lot of people aren't. I think they're not reminded. And also, I don't think it's, it's in a completely different place. And as we saw, a lot of people are driving or exercising, walking the dog. They're not near their computer where they would go to a, a financial way or leave a review. Because leaving a review means you have to go to your keyboard and actually go to a place to review it. It's not like I think on iTunes, doesn't it come up on, there's a place underneath, I think, like if you're listening to it, that's right. It, it should be easy enough to be able to give it stars and then give a review. Relatively easy. I mean, you still have to want to do it. It's not something you can fall into easily. Right. But not when you're driving, please don't do it. True. Yeah. For a not quarter when you're of walking you. the dog and not walking when you're the dog could be okay. I mean, look both ways if you're at a street or whatever, but pause when yeah. your dog is chasing a squirrel, then <laughs> Um, as podcast listeners know, it's common to be asked at the end, please rate and subscribe. And I've never done that uh, partially because I have on good authority that that doesn't actually affect the ranking very much. That the only thing that matters in iTunes, or we're supposed to call it Apple Podcasts now, the only thing that matters there is how many recent subscribers you have. So if you want to subscribe to this po podcast, please do. If you want to subscribe your friend's phone to this podcast, please do. <laughs> But then on the more organic side, like you said, if you want to share it on social media, I mean, that's worth its weight in gold sometimes. A good referral, a good recommendation. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it reaches four people, like the conversion rate to listenership could be high. That's the thing to do to thank your favorite podcast. Facebook is more likely to boost the account you're trying to boost by having some kind of interaction. Yeah. So when somebody comes out with a podcast, like your podcast comes out, it lands and I see it on my iPhone and I say to myself, oh, that was good. I listened to it. I learned something. I should share it from your personal Facebook feed. Well, not your personal, but the Data Skeptic podcast Facebook feed to my feed. And then that boosts your feed. True. Yeah. Okay. So, but this think most people don't think of it that way. You know, they... I've had some where I've wanted to share it and it's not on your feed. Mm. So I have to go to their website. I find it on their website and then I move it over to my Facebook page. And that doesn't help your algorithms for your Facebook Good page point. to get, I don't know. It's, it's like, 
it's probably a little thing, but to me, I like to do it so that it's getting the best bang for the buck for whatever podcast I'm supporting. So, so when a podcaster puts a, a new, um, a new show comes out, they should make sure they immediately go to their Facebook page and it, and, and it lands there so that we can share from there. And then I, I'm probably confusing everybody who's listening, but I think it's the best way to interact is to support. If you don't want to financially support is to at least share it yeah. and, and comment. If you comment, it boosts it as well. Yeah. Especially if you're someone who can't financially support, that's a great way. Just mm-hmm. tell a friend. Do we have an age? Oh, that's on your other um, survey. So we didn't ask age in this. I could, we do for those who took both surveys, the, the onboarding one and this one, where I asked the age. I can do like a uh, cross tab of that, but for this, for under, we've got I think eighty eight respondees to our podcast survey, so a good amount, but not quite enough to cross tab. There isn't like a firm statistical number there that you have to get, but I just know from experience you won't have necessarily inferences you can draw. It'll break down to a handful of people in some groups. I think you. I think on your onboarding one, I noticed it was a, you tend to go, what are you, about 45 or something is about your medium age? Give me a second. I'm going to pull that up. I think it was in the 40s. So our age group, yeah, for, that we asked, oh, whoops, hold on, which, you know what? I think I failed to ask about age. You had an age group, right? Like. I think I missed. I asked about gender identity, education level, professional title, income. I'm going to claim that as, you know, my indifference to people's age. And I just forgot entirely. Interesting. I need to add that to onboarding, though. That's a good point. Wow. I guess so. I thought I'd seen it. Maybe I saw it somewhere else. Well, I don't know. But most of your listeners are from America. That I haven't asked about primarily because it's hard to ask about country. Well, actually, it's two things. So to ask about country, you should have a proper drop down where it auto fills the names of the countries and all that. And I just have to code that. (laughs) I haven't gotten around to it. I want to. But I know independently a lot about country and have for years because we get the IP address of the download, Mm -hmm. which is the most the like ground truth. Who downloads the podcast is the closest to the listenership. Uh, slightly different from people who w- will respond to a survey, which is a much smaller population. And from that, I think we're between 65 and 70 percent uh, United States most months. Where, where's your secondaries and third? Oh, I sh- I'd have to log in to look, but it, it's uh, Australia is surprisingly high. Yeah, the Australians love podcasts. UK, mm-hmm. of course, Germany and India, I think, are the others. I don't know the exact order, but I'm sure that's my top five. Well, I'm not surprised about Australia because those people really do listen to a lot of podcasts and you've been on the Skeptic Zone. I have. I was lucky to be on Skeptic Zone. Yeah. Yeah. So I would think they would go, oh, wow. Check out this American dude. He's this. What would they call you? American bloke or something? Hopefully not a bogan. Yeah. <laughs> not a bogan, but a bloke. <laughs> bloke. I think they call us blokes. I'll take it. But, um, you know, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Um so I think it's I think it's really interesting how these how surveys really tell us so much more about the story of our listenership. Well, not that I have a podcast, but of the listenership. And it surprises me again about how few people are supporting. And it's really odd. It really is odd. I, I think that maybe if they had a way of making it easier. True. Yeah. I mean, there is if there was like a quick button, everyone could click right now. I'm sure I'd get a bunch of donations from just like click this button that's in the air. But the fact of the matter is, it's no go to a place, log in, make an account, put in your details. Oh, that card's expired. And, you know, and like it's just people have to move on with their day. (laughs) You're absolutely right. Well, I had it. Oh, here. Here's an example. I had a woman, because I do this thing with psychics, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's one psychic I spent a lot of time on who is a hot reader. He's going to your Facebook page and he's reading your Facebook page. Prior to the supposed reading, yeah. Yes, and then he's claiming he's getting it from from the dead departed. Okay, Uh we know this is happening because we we have baited Facebook accounts or emails sent it to him and then gotten the reading And he's reading the Facebook page or the email back. Okay. We've done this several times. So we know he's hot reading. 
a woman reached out to me. She was, she's frustrated with the psychic. So I wrote to her and I said, well, you should just go ahead and try to get your money back from him. Don't try to get the reading. And she says, Oh, well, I have a reading scheduled tomorrow. And I said, well, he's going to read your Facebook page. And she's like, what, what are you talking about? She had no idea. And so I said, he's, and I went to her Facebook page and I said, well, this, and he's going to find this and he's going to find this. She goes, but you and I are not friends. How could you see that? I said, well, it's right there. And I've just clicked on your husband's page. So I know what's going on with your husband and I've clicked on your son's page. And now I know what's going on with your son. And because of all that, they're all linked together. Um, not only can I figure out who, who is who, because even if the about section on a Facebook page doesn't say brother, husband, sister, cousin, whenever somebody's commenting on a picture, people say things like, I remember aunt Louise or, Hey cousin, what's new? Or hey, uh, auntie or, sure. Thea or Theo. And so you can figure out the relationships and then you click on their Facebook page. Anyway, it's all public. Even if you think it's not, it's very little is private. All your information's out there. If somebody really wants to know about you, you can do a Google search on them and you're probably going to appear somewhere. I use uh, newspapers.com. I also have newspapers archive. And almost everybody who was born, at least in in Western society, or at least in America, you've got a birth announcement or a wedding announcement mm -hmm. or a college, um, you'd graduated from college or you graduated from high school or you were on the drama team or you were, you had an accident when you were seven and it got in the paper or, I mean, you're in a newspaper probably, unless your name is so common, or you go to Ancestry. Mm -hmm. And Ancestry or any of those sites will give me all kinds of documents on you. And it isn't just you, Kyle. It is all I got to do is find out the name of one of your family members, especially if it's unusual. And yeah. maybe a location. You're from Ohio, right? Chicago, but close. Chicago. Okay. Well, they're almost there. the same thing. You know, they both have O-E kind of names. Uh -huh. C and O. Midwestern. <laughs> I'm only kidding you guys. I know the difference between Chicago and Ohio. Don't write in. <laughs> <laughs> My family's from Ohio. But the point is, is that it's once you kind of get that name and maybe something unusual and a location, we're in. Yeah. So I told the lady, don't worry about it. Just live your life. Just assume everything's public and assume <laughs> that everybody has access to it. And if they don't, then be surprised, but just assume they all do. That's what I told her. Do you think people are hearing that lesson? Is there a trend away from uh, belief in ESP and psychics and these sorts of things? No. Same baseline? <laughs> Sadly, no. Sadly, no. Yeah. I, I think that the divide is actually happening where people are, they believe they may have varying degrees of belief, but um, I think there's another side of it that people who don't believe are ridiculing the people who do mm. believe and they don't see it for the emo emotional manipulation that it is. And it's very sad. And um, I think it makes people more isolated and less likely to want to find out why it is the way it is. You know, what is it the psychics are doing to make it look like they're real? I've just put out a series of videos can I plug my video? Yes, please. But what I've been doing is I'm, is I want to listen to videos of psychic readings and I want to analyze them. So I'm listening to it and then breaking it down. I've just done four. They were the psychic John Edward. He was in Australia. He had a radio show and there was four readings on the radio show. So I listened to each one separately. About 40 years he's been doing this and he's really smooth. But he's done, what, tens of thousands of readings. So, of course, he's smooth. But when you listen to the four I did and you really mm -hmm. break them down and analyze them, like I said, it's eye-opening because you see a pattern of how he does it. For example, there's four readings. In three of the readings, right at the beginning, he said, I'm getting the month of March, something about an anniversary or birthday. Does that mean anything to you? So I thought to myself, why March? And then what is it about March that's different, Kyle? Let's see if you can. Um, 
Because I caught this. It made me think about it. Why would a psychic pick March? Yeah, I don't have an insight there. Okay. Let me give you another hint. The next reading he does, he says, I'm getting an eight, which always means August to me. So August, something happened in the month of August. It was an anniversary or a birthday. So I'm giving you two data points there, uh-huh. Mr. Data Skeptic. What do you come up with? They're third and eighth. Uh, I don't know if they're not. They're away from the holidays. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm going to give you a third data point. Let's see if you catch on it. All right. So then on another reading he did, he said, I'm getting December. December is um, something is 12. It's connected to you somehow, uh, birthday or anniversary. There's three data sets. I'm putting you on the line here. Let's see if you can come up with it. March, August, December. March, August, December. All I see is a 1 in 12 chance. Well, apparently John would have fooled me. 31 days. Oh, interesting. <laughs> they all have 31 days in them. He didn't pick February. Right. And I'm, wondering, and I'm thinking, I want to now I want to watch more of his videos and listen to see if he ever picks months with 30 days or 28 days or 27, 29 days, right? So it's a small odds. It's a small percentage that from 30 to 31, but it is playing in the odds when you think about it. Yeah. Right? And that's a play, right, on – it's an odds thing. Yeah, risk minimization. Well, where can we find these breakdown videos? They're on my YouTube channel, Susan Gerbeck, and you can find them there because they are right there. And it says uh, – right now they're called Breaking Down Psychic Readings. You can't miss them, but I hope people will come and look at them and give me all the feedback you possibly can – Please listen to the readings and then yeah. tell me what I missed and then tell me what the psychic missed, because I think that's something we completely forget. So when we're all done, we say, he got so many hits and you think, no, he didn't. And mm-hmm. what should have been there is not there. For sure. We'll have some links in the show notes as well for listeners to click on. This has really gone in some yeah. weird, uh, weird angles for just talking about a podcast survey that... <laughs> appreciate you uh, um, sitting and listening to me talk and yammer about psychics. Oh, this has been fun and informative. Thanks as (laughs) always, Susan.